So the main questions that the capacity model addresses are, and these are really simple, um, is there enough water present to maintain the dam? Are there enough of the and the right type of woody resources present to support dam building? Can a dam be built at base flow and can it persist typical floods? And so for the model that we run that you can access on the internet and get that data, it's usually derived from just readily available, nationally available data sets, such as the National Hydrography NHD data. So perennial uh, streams is usually what we uh, limit that to. And then for the vegetation, we use land fire, which is a Landsat 30 meter derived vegetation data set for land cover classification. And we use both what we refer to as EVT, which is existing veg type, vegetation type, and BPS. And BPS is biophysical setting, which is an estimation of what was there historically. So we can derive our outputs as historic estimations and then current estimations. And then we use USGS regional regression equations for both base flow and Q2 to get at can a dam be built or can it persist? And then for the slope measurements, we use NHD 10 meter data for both slope and stream power estimate estimations. So we're just gonna go into this a little bit uh, deeper. So for water, we look at the perennial network, as I said earlier. I'm gonna be showing uh, data from, from the mid Willamette project that I worked on in Corvallis. Um, somebody, um, can you mute, can make sure everybody's muted, please? Mute your phone, somebody's um, getting some background. So Corvallis, Oregon would be in the center here. And so I'll be showing a lot of data from this project. And as, as I mentioned for the, we use for the woody vegetation side of it as one input into the fuzzy inference system. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on this. So in one here, it's just depicting that land fire uh, data, just the classification. And then based on the literature, uh, we can assume some preferences for beaver for dam building material. And we, we code this from zeros to four as far as beaver preferences. And then we clip the data by 30 and 100 meters. So most of beaver's utilization of vegetation is within about 30 meters of the stream because as I mentioned earlier, they're prey, they're not good on their feet. And so they're very leery of being out of the water. They will go as far as hundred meters uh, for specific vegetation. And so this kind of, this slide kind of depicts this. So this is a, a stream in, in my backyard, it's called Spawn Creek. Uh, flow direction is down here. And so this is, a, this is an Aspen forest that's basically been mowed down in this photo. And you can see these uh, skid trails. These are beaver skid trails. They go about as far as 100 meters, maybe a little bit more, you know, for their favorite species, for their, their chocolate, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, most of the utilization is closer, 30 meters. I did want to mention here in this slide, too, is this, this idea of, I talked about not everything's going to be at capacity at the same time. And one of those reasons is the beaver here, after they uh, kind of devoured the aspen, they moved down. These are new dams. And as they're building down here, if I had had a recent photo, I wish I did, these, this forest is now mowed down and this is recovered. And so that's kind of the rotational crop farming thing that, that happens with beaver as they bounce around. And that dynamic is really important too, because um, these ponds can then, potentially these ponds can blow out and provide different habitat, um, but then they've got ponding down here. And so that's kind of that ever-changing uh, mosaic of what, what beaver provide as they move around. So I did want to just kind of mention just these broad categories of how we classify the vegetation into these five categories from unsuitable, you know, things such as 
ag land to barren to you know preferred material aspen cottonwood willow depending on where you are it might be young maple might be other things um, but this is just kind of give you an idea of that so i think so this slide is important but it's probably the densest kind of slide that i'm going to show and so you know, i thought because you guys are scientists researchers it might be worth going into it in detail so in a here this is what this is depicting is the 100 meter buffer the 30 meter buffer and then the 300 meter segments so that's important just to, to think about how this is kind of our grain size or our sampling uh, scheme and then b shows the vegetation and categorized by preferences for dam building and then C is that 30 meter buffer. And then it's, these are average values for that 300 meter reach. So that value 2.75 is that value for that reach within the 30 meter buffer. And then over here is a hundred meter buffer and that value would be 2.16. So this becomes input into the fuzzy inference system. And the inference system is really simple. So it just comes up with these rules, these simple rules that, for example, suitability of that stream side vegetation, 30 meter buffer, say it's preferred, and then the wider 100 meter buffer is suitable, then the output for just the vegetation is frequent. And I'll talk about these values frequent. Frequent would be kind of the second highest tier of like what we expect to see as far as dam building capacity. Um, and so this is just a fuzzy inference system looking at membership functions and just to make it really simple. So on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we just have these values from zero to four. Four doesn't show up, four is here. And if you look at these, these are simply just those categories. So for example, this is fairly suitable here. And then this one out here is that preferred. So it just shows that these are fuzzy numbers in that there's overlap with the joining numbers. They're not crisp because we feel like this categorical data, we're not that certain on how good it is. But what a fuzzy inference system does is allows us to get away with using categorical data because it doesn't make this crisp assumption. Um, and you know, this is something I'm kind of breezing over this, but I think this is enough information for people to understand it at this point. And so this would be just based on the vegetation, these would be those outputs. So this would be that frequent. Um, it would have a little overlap up to 12 dams, but it'd go all the way out to 40 dams. Um, so if we look at how this looks on the landscape, so this is this mid Willamette study area that I'll use throughout the talk. And so we have zeros in red, and then up to fours, uh, green, the preferred or categories is darker green. We can kind of toggle this as existing versus historic. And we can see some differences and maybe not surprising. We've made some changes in these bottom lands. So a lot of this more preferred building material historically has now been converted to maybe barely suitable to unsuitable. We look historically. So let's move on to the next uh, two questions as far as can dams be built at base flow. So we to get it uh, stream power, we first have to derive a reach slope, which is really simple. It's just rise over run. So we measure the at the top of the reach and the bottom of the reach the elevation, and then that distance to get uh, reach slope. And then stream power is a simple equation. We just do Q, which is discharge at base flow in this case, using regional regression equations. And then it's simply discharge times slope. You know, there's some constants in here as far as like gravity and the weight of water. But for this, just knowing, you know, it's basically just slope times discharge. This is a pretty underwhelming map in this setting. There's very few areas that can't, that the model saying can't have dams be built. 
And so maybe a little more interesting example would be in the in the Yellowstone headwaters, where you can see more of these areas that can't be uh, built on. And then we look at can dams likely withstand a typical flood. And for that, we use Q2, which uh, which is just a two-year reoccurrence um, flood interval. We use the same equation for that. And so those outputs are a little more interesting. So we see in the, the reds are showing areas that, are, that could blow out. So basically, these are dams. These are areas where if a dam was built, the model is saying would blow out. And then these categories might be a little hard to see, but then we're also just saying, you know, potential blowout, potential breach, and then the greens would are areas where the dam would persist. So one more of these kind of weird graphs that people probably have never seen are weird, but just fuzzy inference system membership function. So uh, similar to what we looked at before. So this would be the output from the veg side. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the the hydrology will limit what the vegetation can provide. So say there's the right vegetation there, but the hydrology, there's too much stream power. So stream power is just simply the ability of the stream to, to do work. So it's in a wattage, it's, it's a wattage. And so based on empirical information, we know that dams have a hard time being built, you know, much over say 190 watts and they blow out at say 2000 ish and so we we kind of know that empirically and that's kind of the basis for the model and so we get the outputs similar to what i showed before these different categories of how how these would look and then i think this is kind of like finally to something that's useful this is an output an existing dam capacity output we have these um, categories, which I'll I'll show here in a second. Um, and these categories, I think, are w w useful to, to, to go over in a little bit of detail. So none is pretty obvious. We're predicting that there's no dams that could be supported. Rare would be just one dam. So when you see these orange lines, this might be a dispersing beaver that's just trying to figure it out, building in really tough places that constantly blow out. Occasional, this would be, these are not ideal settings. Occasional dam can be supported. And frequent, uh, these are pretty much ideal, maybe slightly resource limited. And then pervasive are, these are those areas where extensive dam complexes can be supported. It's not resource limited. Um, so if you don't believe me, on these densities, well, let's, let's go to a place in Wyoming. This is I-80. If any of you've ever driven across the country and gone through the flat country of uh, Wyoming, hopefully not in the winter in a uh, snowstorm, but this is just off I-80. And let's zoom in here and look at just an area zoomed in. These are all beaver dams in these different threads. And so just counting them, it's nearly 100 dams per kilometer. So a single thread in this case is probably close to 40 dams per kilometer. And so I think those upper limits are probably pretty appropriate. And so this, this is the output in, in this area of the upper Willamette in Oregon. And we can look at historic compared to it and kind of toggle back and forth. See that historically there was a lot more blue and that we lost some of that capacity due to land use and changes in, in vegetation. And so these are these are the capacity outputs that we um, you know use as as one of the I think the important outputs of the BRAT model. Ways that we can validate this is we can do you know, desktop censuses to come up with densities based on what's actually on the landscape. In Western Oregon, this is a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to do in, in the east, eastern seaboard, where you got dense forest canopy, making it difficult to see the stream. Uh, this works great in settings such as this, where in kind of my neck of the woods, Intermountain West, where it's open, 
So each of the blue dots is a dam and you can basically get a dam count. So say on this reach, there's 27 plus or minus four or five dams. And so you can get a density estimate that can be directly compared to the, to the BRAT model. And I'll kind of get back to this um, after, I'm gonna go into the management section, but we'll get back to this, how we can use this um, a little bit more. So kind of shifting gears here, I think kind of the, I guess the thing that kind of keeps us all coming back to Beaver, if it was all just, you know, roses and rainbows, um, it would probably get boring working with Beaver. But Beaver make it interesting for us because there's no denying that Beaver are going to cause problems in the built environment. And as a result, a capacity model alone is not enough. We need some type of risk model that assesses um, these impacts. And I think having a risk model builds some credibility with, with those people that are impacted by it. And I do think it's one of the reasons why the BRAT model has been kind of taken, taken up by a diversity of groups is with, you know, that recognition that beaver in the wrong um, setting can cause uh, serious damage. So thank goodness for GIS because we can get readily available data for inf infrastructure and we can map that and we, we can look at how close things are to the river, do proximity analysis. So the main things that we can get at are rivers, I mean, sorry, roads, roads within the valley bottom, uh, road crossings, which become culverts, um, railroads, railroad crossings, canals. And in some cases, we can get more information depending on some Department of Transportation provides culvert information. But this is kind of the lowest common denominator. We can usually get all this data. And so with this, these, this proximity to these floodable infrastructure, we can map that out and we can say, well, how far is the closest threat? And that would be kind of this output here. Basically, reds are right adjacent to, so these are really high probability of conflict and yellows and oranges are, are kind of in the middle. We're looking for areas that are more green uh, where you don't have this close proximity. But this is kind of unrealistically pessimistic. It's just how close this infrastructure is to the stream and it's not how close beaver dam building might be. So what we really need to do is intersect dam building capacity with proximity to this infrastructure. And that's what this map rep represents. So this is where streams are close to the infrastructure and where beaver can build dams. And so this highlights these areas of potential risk. And in red are the major risk areas and then down to you know, minor risk in blue and, and gray as being that negligible risk. Um, so this next map I'm gonna show is kind of where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And it's really those areas that have low human beaver conflict and high dam capacity. This map's really hard to read, so I'll take off the background. The take home here is the green areas here are what we're referring to as the easiest areas as far as lowest hanging fruit, so to speak, for beaver conservation, beaver restoration work. And blues might be those areas that might straightforward, strategic, kind of quick return areas. And so I think for me, the BRAT model, what it can provide is folks a first order approximation of where they could potentially work. And so what I would do if I was using the BRAT model, I would go out and look at these areas that the, the model is picked. And then, you know, there's a bunch of questions you probably ask, have to ask yourself, you know, where should we work? You know, it's kind of the question. And sometimes part of that answer is, well, we've got a willing landowner or this is where people have told us to work. So sometimes, you know, it's tough to know, you know, where, but what you should be doing, uh, you know, what type of work should you should you do? So what are you trying to do, I guess? Um, what are the impairments you're trying to address? 
what are the species you're benefiting? What are the uplifts that you want? Will really determine, you know, from say the BRAT model can be a line of evidence, but these are the kind of the questions and what type of risk are you trying to, I guess, what type of risk are you risk adverse completely? Are there some risks that you're willing to take because you can mitigate for beaver? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, the, you know, building deep beaver deceivers or pond levelers or some type of coexistence strategies. Um, but I think we're the kind of work we can do, I think, are kind of summed up in this slide. You know, we can conserve where beaver are now, maybe promote them. Or we can use beaver coexistence strategies, as I mentioned. We can translocate. Perhaps BDAs can be help, helpful in the release sites. We can restore those areas that might need riparian restoration before beaver can really um, take a footing. You know, we can help beaver out by building, maybe it's BDAs, um, maybe it's different structures. Or simply if beaver aren't in the picture because there's not the tolerance um, for them, and that happens in Utah quite a bit, to be honest. There's still a lot of folks out there that the only good beaver is the dead beaver. And so we we fight that a lot. And so we're we're kind of in some cases, all we can do is mimic beaver. I think this slide's probably really useful for your group. I think um, what this comes down to is how you can use a Brad model. And I uh, so for me, you can compare what's realize a firm say you go out and you do a, a dam count even using imagery so you have an essence of where beaver are on the landscape compared to the capacity models you can look at those reaches that we're saying are low-hanging fruit and you can flag those as conservation areas and so maybe to restate this so in areas that you know that beaver are on the landscape based on looking at google earth or other imagery and you know from the model that's showing that there's high capacity, those are areas that I feel like those are crucial that we just identify. And I think in a lot of cases, a trap enclosure could be a great thing just to make sure we hold on to those areas. And in reaches where, say from your census, there's not there's no realized capacity, so it's un or under capacity. But you, from the model, it's saying there is capacity. Those could be areas that you target for restoration. In some cases, you might need to mimic beaver, or you might want to build a BDA to get them started there. And in the quick return areas, similarly, there might be some restoration work you can do there, or there might be some different land use practices. Maybe it's cattle grazing is impacting the area, maybe it needs grazing management. And if there are long-term areas that could be restored strategically, you know, those are worth investing in too. And so that's kind of how I see, you know, being able to utilize um, the Brad outputs. See how I am time-wise. Okay, so I'm <clears throat> wrapping things up here, so. I just wanted to go over some recent advancements here. And so now we have the ability to do a lot of this on our phones, which is really, I think, great. So you can so you can run the BRAC capacity model out in the field. So you can go and you can walk your reach and you can make these same assessments we do kind of in this black box of GIS. You can actually just go and categorize the vegetation as you see it stream side and the full riparian and come up with an estimate just based on vegetation. Then you can make some assumptions as far as base flow. Could a dam be built? Would it persist in a typical flood? And then, you know, is a is a reach slope appropriate? And then come up with a combined combined output for capacity. And so this is a link to that. You can get to that here. You can also go out and collect uh, beaver census in the field, beaver surveys. You can just collect dam locations. Um, we've also got this at the desktop. You can do the same thing uh, using imagery. 
And then also you can collect beaver sign with another survey one, two, three app that we've developed here. So right now the at all lab is heavily invested in doing desktop dam censusing. It's just serendipitous that the state of Montana, Utah, and New Mexico about at the same time reached out to us and thought that this was important. And I, I think it's a great um, asset just to have all beaver dams that are on the landscape now assessed. I mean, it takes hundreds and hundreds of hours to do this, but I think it's gonna be an incredible data set. And, you know, you know, one of the obvious usage, usage of it is just to do that direct comparison with, with the model, because you're comparing densities to densities, you know, what was estimated and what's actually there. And so I think it's a great way to kind of localize the model, calibrate it, validate it. And so this section, because of time, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of leave these slides for folks just to explore the Riverscapes data exchange on their own. And this is actually really exciting. In, in a way, I wish I would have just kind of gone and just drilled through this data, but um, I didn't. Um, this kind of lays out all, all the model data that's on the Riverscape Exchange and the BRAT model in particular, if you want to drill in. This is an instructions to do it. What's kind of exciting is we've got data west-wide. These models have been run all throughout the western United States. Some on the, in the east now and uh, Midwest is kind of starting to get populated, but it's pretty exciting. I guess the caveat I'm going to bring up is that this is this is uncalibrated data, I'm kind of throwing it out there. It's basically as a model I describe using readily available data, um, and I think the point that I'm going to make in the recap here is what we can do is yeah we can run the model with nationally available data, but we can also in the field now. You guys can go out on the field of the desktop and run it with better data. And if you know better, this can and should be overridden. And so what I see on the data exchange is multiple versions of the BRAT run, an uncalibrated, a version where you know folks state what they did to um, what their method was, and that's provided to folks as well. And I think that's what's exciting for me in the development of BRAT. You know, as I mentioned, it's been around for almost 10 years. But I think what's exciting now is that we're getting better and better data. You know, 3DEP, USGS 3DEP data is becoming available. And the model is ready to ingest any type of new data we have. And so I think, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out, better data we have as inputs, the better outputs we have. And if folks can you know, localize it, collect data that they know is meaningful because you know your, you know your watersheds. And so for me, that's really kind of a excitement, exciting uh, you know, progress we're making or direction we're going um, with the model. So I'm gonna stop talking now and um, open up to questions. And I will stay around later if, if folks have a bunch of stuff they wanna talk about, but I appreciate you guys' attention. Thanks. Awesome, thanks Wally. Um, yeah, that was great. Um, oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so I think we can open up for questions and I'll just point out right now, I, I put a link uh, where you guys can go and download uh, this PowerPoint so you can see it. You can see all the, the links as well as how to access the data um, and, and all of that there. And then what we will also post uh, the recording of this, which we started a little late, but we'll, we'll you know, put it on, on the Beaver Institute website. Um, yeah, so I think now we should open it up to questions. Does anyone? can raise your hand or you can just shout out.
Okay. Well, my question is that I know that Oregon State has a three-year beaver action plan that they're implementing. And in that report, it says that they reached out to secure funding to use the BRAP model for the entire state. And I'm just wondering if you've worked with them or if you've heard anything about that um, going forward. Yeah, I haven't heard that specifically, but we are working. There is an uncalibrated run for Oregon and we're working with Bonneville um, Environmental Foundation to secure money to validate the model. And then my follow-up question would be, how have you heard of the beaver model called Eager that's down by Emily Fairfax? And how does this differ between that model? Yeah, so the, I was a co-author on the Eager uh, model. So what the Eager model is using is AI to derive uh, beaver dams. So it's a way to identify beaver dams. Um, I would say at this point, and this is, and this probably can change really rapidly. I would say right now, AI is not that good at identifying beaver dams. It's too complex, really difficult. There's a lot of false positives that come out, but it can be useful as a first order approximation. So what I mean is like, if you ran eager and just came up with all these dam all, all what they're saying is dams then you could go through as you know i think we are the true supercomputer then you could go and say oh this is garbage this is garbage and so i would say that's in the future i'm blown away by what ai can do so i i i don't question that it could in the future be really useful but right now there's no substitute in my mind for people doing it like I have technicians that spend as I mentioned hundreds of hours going through imagery and I feel really confident about what they um, can delineate as beaver dams but the model is just right now it's pretty questionable thank you yeah thanks good questions there was another question in the chat and it just says at some point you mentioned that you made a determination about vegetation sustainability Oh, sorry, suitability and max dam density. Uh, how did you determine that relationship? Um, I, well, I can, maybe I'll answer that because I'm not sure if I actually made that connection. But what I would say is I think max dam density becomes literally a physics thing where we see beaver dams backed up to each other. So, and what we found is well, that's in a in typical settings, that's about 40 dams per kilometer at the maximum. And that's from you see literature that supports that as well. And then as far as the vegetation side of things, we based the preferences on the literature as well, just where there is a lot of good studies out there talking about in different settings where, you know, what was the preferred species. So I think it's worth mentioning that as we start using BRAT in, in different areas, those preferences change. You know, for example, Aspen isn't everywhere. Um, you know, Cottonwood necessarily isn't any, everywhere, but there are preferred species. And so that those preferences change uh, regionally. I'll just tag on that. Do you kind of also include kind of having the diversity of vegetation? That's available as opposed to like, oh, great, there's lots of willows. They like that. Yeah, I think it's, I think what's interesting about aspen and willow is they're actually, there's these feedback loops. The more they get hit by beaver, the more they regenerate. It's really interesting, you know, this co evolution. And so I think there are certain species that just benefit from each other. You know, in the West, aspen is declining. But where beaver are, aspen isn't declining. And so I think there's that. And I'd say the diversity is useful as well. I mean, I think one way to look at these areas too is conifer encroachment is an issue in a lot of riparian areas that people work in or just in different invasive species. Having beaver there can help with that. 
it's not always, you know, a, a perfect fit, but yeah. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Rosalie. I'm coming from the Rio Grande National Forest in southern Colorado. Um, and I've been using the BRAT tool a fair bit, or at least the version of the BRAT tool that's been run for Colorado, um, the Colorado Beaver Restoration Assessment Tool. It looks like it's hosted by the Colorado Wetland Information Center. But one thing I've noticed about at least the version I've been working in is that it doesn't show the layer with um, any of the infrastructure information. Uh, it just shows like the, you know, the dam capacity model. So I was just curious if that was like a separate model or if the infrastructure portion of that was going to be added to Colorado or if the model would be rerun or just kind of what was going on there. Yeah, I, so I'd say that in this presentation at the bottom where I show the Riverscapes um, exchange, data exchange, you can use the data there. And that's a full model run, including the risk model. Um, I wasn't involved in the run that you're referring to for Colorado. So I just, okay. I would suggest um, using that data and you can download it, you can view it on the viewer. I think you're gonna be, if you haven't played with that, I think you're gonna be pretty impressed with just having everything web-based and easy access. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think yeah. that will be really helpful. Yeah, welcome. Um, and then we have another one in the chat that says, could you talk a little bit more about why 300 meter river segments were used, were selected for Brett? Um, and is this the smallest unit? Um, and I guess it would be, why can you go smaller? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a great question. And I think when when Joe Wheaton and I first developed the BRAT model, we thought it was appropriate because of the 30 meter pixels and the 10 meter DM. I can see maybe going down to as small as 100 meter segments if you have, say, one meter data for your vegetation and your your slope. And so I I think it's just a scale issue as far as how resolute that data is. That your your input data, but if you're using if you're using the current data, I don't think you're going to gain much by subsetting it. I think you're just going beyond the resolution of the inputs. Uh -huh. Cool. Um, and then I guess a uh, uh, quick question, just uh, in terms of so, based on the kind of beaver dam censuses censuses you've done so far. And comparing them with uh, the model, do you find like there are there particular areas that you feel like you've really kind of uh, got it calibrated pretty well versus other areas that are more of a challenge or maybe are more of a judgment call that you, you know maybe maybe actually need to be verified in the field or or just looked at a little closer if if someone were to run this elsewhere. Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe it's it's. Maybe too soon to answer all that. I think we're learning a lot. We're we're kind of in the data gathering phase right now. I mean, one thing that's really we're finding is in a watershed that beaver are allowed to kind of do their thing, there's thousands and thousands of dams, which is pretty amazing. And I think what's coming out of that is we're realizing that right now we're using uh just a network model. So we're using the NHD network, which is pretty, as anybody looked at it, it's not very good when you get into multi-threaded systems. And so what we're realizing is that in multi-threaded systems, we're really gonna have to change the model from a network model to more of what we refer to as a hybrid model, which also accounts for the whole valley bottom. And so these estimates um, that are based on just a single thread are going to change a lot. And so I think that's, you know, one thing we're learning is just kind of adapting to that. You know, I'd say another thing that we're learning is, and one reason I kind of started out with those different dams is that in some settings, these dams are sometimes really hard to pick up because they are small, but they're still useful and, and beaver are still on the landscape. 
And so for me, um, I think one thing I'm learning is just the diversity of what what is a beaver dam. And then maybe on, along those lines too is seeing the necessity in the model to also incorporate beaver sign themselves, beaver sign itself. Because he, because as I mentioned in a translocation setting, if you were to go and say, oh, I did a census and there's no beaver dams, so we're going to go up and we're going to we're going to um, translocate these beaver without doing a beaver occupancy survey. I think you could waste your time and money because if beaver are on the landscape in those settings, they're territorial, and you might just waste your time and money in stacking beaver on beaver. So I think what we're kind of learning is that that whole continuum of, you know, just beaver being there, even small dams to chocked full of beaver. I think that's kind of the information the census is giving us. And I think your question is a good one. Check back with me in a couple months and I'll have a lot more information. Cause I think that's where it's exciting. We'll see where it ties with how well it, calibrates and validates the BRAT model, all the census information. Well, that's great. Yeah, and that could set my, my, ne my next question was just gonna be, yeah, about the NHD data, which is, you know, normally a, a, just a line feature, you know, that goes through this broad wide valley, especially down lower where you're showing, maybe, you know, we're showing lower potential, even though maybe there should be more because you're running all the stream power through that one little section, um, as yeah. opposed to it was multi-threaded and, and a little more diverse and, um, okay, we, we can talk details in another time, but cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are a handful of questions in here about how accessible and easy is the model to run? Um, we have one from a graduate student who wants to run the model for a particular watershed. Is there a good step-by-step -step literature online or a video series that will walk, walk them through the process? I would really say get the data that's on the Riverscapes Exchange. I think it's a way easier because um, the model isn't the model is not that easy to run to be and one of the reasons why is just just it's just all the little software that kind of goes into it is it can be kind of troubling to to work with not to say that it can't be done but I would just say um, you know unless you're a programmer. There's going to be some headaches kind of doing it. And I don't know if that's, you know, that's the answer that I'm coming up with right now. But I mean, the right person, if that's part of their grad program, and they want to learn to do that, then it's, yeah, it can be done. Um, but I would say the first thing I would do is just go and get the data. And then if you feel like you, you want to actually run it yourself, then go from there. Um, okay, yeah, I just threw the the links at the end of the presentation, but I also just threw the data exchange link in the chat for anyone who's interested. Um, do you have any more questions or I guess I have another broader, just your your opinion based on kind of the, uh, the you know, you've done these assessments, the kind of management plans. Uh, as well as, you know, lots of the restoration work. And when you look at these and you think about, okay, you know, limited resources, funds availability, and especially looking at the areas, a lot of the areas that high, higher capacity are actually kind of, or, or even potential, you know, are headwaters or higher up or away from folks. I mean, I, this is broad. Do you think we should be focusing more of our effort on conservation and conserving healthy or or you know, reverse case that could become healthier as opposed to digging in and trying to uh, do restoration, which you know the success rate is you know varies. We'll we'll say to be polite, um, you know, and ob and obviously you know we would love longitudinal lateral connectivity, but we can only do so much. I think that's a great question, and I I think one of the lessons learned is that. God, you can try really hard to translocate beaver and just fail miserably. And it can be such a money and time suck. And I think without 
if you're going to go down that road, I think you have to just, you know, first you have to get lucky and then you have to like make sure you account for everything. You know, for example, as I mentioned, you know, doing beaver surveys, doing predator surveys, find out where the predators are. And then just the expectation that, hey, if I'm lucky, maybe a third or less are going to actually stick and they're not going to be where you particularly want them to be, maybe. And so I think what I've learned is, and I kind of brought it up in the presentation, if there's beaver on the landscape and they're doing exactly what we want, let's just really take care of them. And I think that's the, the most important thing. And I think promoting beaver from there right, and, you know, getting to expand out, you know, taking care of them. I think trapping closures, you know, just uh, anything that we can do uh, to protect and preserve those areas, I think are, are just crucial. And I think it's money well spent. And maybe it's something that early on, I, I always thought, I kind of had this silver bullet, you know, it's like, we have the source population, maybe these beaver that are seen as nuisance that we can pull from these areas, translocation, put them in these new areas and they're going to take over. That's just a little bit of a pipe, pipe dream and kind of pie in the sky. And I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I think it's also just riddled with just complexities and things that are far outside our control. Um. So it's 306 so i'll just make one announcement that so next month and this is while emily's still on the line here emily uh Eisken is going to present on uh using remote sensing and beaver restoration from project buy-in through monitoring so it should be a uh yeah should be a, a great talk she's got some really cool papers out there as well that you should all look into um yeah and other than that we can i think there's a few more questions that popped up but i just want to get that out there before people have to run Oh, there's Emily. Okay. I was like, oh, did you just hang up as soon as I mentioned your name? Okay. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Great. We're looking forward to it, Emily. Um, okay. Yeah. So there is another question about um, uh, uh, any ideas you have for working in the Pacific Northwest um, with the, you know, kind of using the model with, where there's the dense canopy cover. I guess that would also go for the Northeast. Yeah, yeah exactly. And Interesting enough is that's where a lot of my energy is right now is, is making modifications for, you know, a very different environment. And, you know, I, I think what we've learned is the remote censusing is really difficult. And so getting people out on the, out in the rivers and doing surveys. So coming up with steady designs where you're, you're sampling a certain, percentage of the rivers and getting some densities for dams, you know, is crucial. And then I think just appreciation for some of the land uses that are there. There's a lot of degraded streams that are ripped down to bedrock that might take what we've noticed is where beaver are starting to build dams that are in areas where there's been wood structures put in to build up some sediment. And so I think there's just some things that you know that are unique to to that area, and then I think the hydrology becomes a lot more important. I mean, the vegetation in in the West is in the Mountain West where I work is probably crucial. I think the hydrology in these flashy systems that experience rain on snow events, and I think the model can be adjusted to to accentuate that part rather than the vegetation, which is typically not that limiting. Okay, I have another one. Maybe this is to you or, or anyone else in the group. I know who we have Dan from the Eager team here as well. Have you, or do you know of anyone who's tried using like the LIDAR, uh, you know, uh, point clouds? So the, the you know, multiple returns to see if you could identify dam, you know, it bounces off the water, it doesn't go through water, but you could certainly probably see a, uh, a dam, or you might even be able to get at vegetation density within those like highly or densely forested areas. I mean, I know that's probably a lot of work to do the point cloud analysis and, and extract that, but um, yeah, I'm just curious if anyone's knows of anyone who's tried it. 
I personally don't. Um, but I think, I mean, these are the type of things that, you know, as technology changes and, you know, availability of data, I mean, I'm just blown away by what you can do with a consumer grade drone as far as building point clouds and yeah. flying specific areas. So I'd say if you got a particular reach and you, you're doing research there, you're doing restoration work and monitoring, I think those are the settings where you could do, you know, small scale, which wouldn't be that big of a deal. But I think large scale, it's probably beyond, you know, what most people can do. Um, but I think there, there could be a use for it. All right. Anyone else have any, any questions, comments? All right. Or, or at this point, I guess, any, any other announcements anyone wants to make to, to the group before we all move on? Okay. Uh, yeah, I guess with that, yeah, thanks a lot, Wally. This was a yeah great presentation. I think super useful for a lot of folks. Um, I put the link to the PowerPoint in there and we will post the video. We'll put the the you know the the PowerPoint itself probably in the Google Drive or somewhere and, and we'll we'll send out an email.